the kinds of issues that Jones is raising on as to the concurrence. So the issues are, is it going to apply to <coughs> boats? Is it going to apply to airplanes? Is it going to apply at the border? Um, is it, what's it mean for the consent um, that's given by an owner? What's it mean for the consent if it's given by the possessor? Um, and then, then there are myriad ways in which GPS, this is all about GPS, by the way, not even getting into how it could affect other types of techniques. So um, what is, in terms of where the department is, um, the first week it came out, guidance was issued about you know, <coughs> stop, <coughs> turn off all your GPS, um, guidance about how to retrieve your GPS if you had not gotten a warrant for the GPS device because it wasn't obvious that you could turn it back on to locate it because now you needed probable cause or a reasonable suspicion to do that. So we had to come up with guidance about how you can locate them without violating um, the <coughs> law. I mean, it's, it's like, you can't make this up. This is like, so that was a big issue. Um, and, G and the FBI alone, I think, had 3,000 GPSs out. Um, so there's an enormous amount of, and that's one agency. Um, so the two memoranda that are being worked on um, are first guidance to the field about just GPS, um, meaning when can you use GPS going forward and what kind of arguments can you make if there are challenges, as of course there will be, understandably, um, as to the application of that decision to ongoing cases, um, including um, something that's difficult, which is that we had to also give guidance about how to sanitize <coughs> cases that are ongoing where GPS was used. So if you've used GPS, for instance, to get probable cause for a search or probable cause for a wiretap, you need to then go back and reevaluate what kind of challenges there will be, whether you can still establish or could have established probable cause without that GPS um, data. So myriad issues on that. Second memoranda is going to be about guidance on what this means for other types of techniques beyond GPS, because there's no reason to think this is going to just end with GPS. And some of that is going to be very much a judgment call. Um, in the same way that we're talking about balancing of, of security and privacy, um, we're trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, and then we're going to be balancing issues of, well, how likely do we think that the court will be doing that in the future against we can't figure out other, any another, another way to do it, and it's in a national security case where there's a vital interest in going up and taking that risk. Um, so very complicated issues uh, and a case that just to the big picture is that the, as you heard today, is that the idea that something was shown to the public, driving on a street, um, walking on a street, that sort of rationale that how can you have a reasonable expectation of privacy was, reje was resoundingly rejected. Um, so how much that is going to be an argument that can be used um, is it, because it's going to come up again and again um, in other contexts is, is I think going to be the lasting legacy. You know, I, I think the court did not wrestle uh, with the problems their decision creates um, because it didn't, usually the, the court tends to be more careful about cabining its decision in terms of, well, we're not addressing this and we're not addressing that and, um, and giving some guidance. Um, guidance which consists of two days might be good, 30 days is too long, not very helpful. Um, <coughs> so um, I think that is the real problem from a law enforcement perspective is that the clarity that was that people look for not <coughs> just in the private industry but in government as well when you're conducting a law enforcement invest investigation it doesn't come from the decision naturally. I, I would just say a couple of really quick things. I think the truly revolutionary effect of this decision is going to be that it seems to me, and I'm not a judicial scholar like a lot of people are here, but it seems to me you now have at least five votes for the proposition that the courts are not going to defer to legislatures, much less the executive, just because there's complex, fast-moving technology involved. And I think that's going to have huge implications. For one thing, as, as Andrew's saying, as the lower courts try to wrestle with how you translate this decision to things like 
social media data, location data that's generated in the internet or by cell phones, you're going to have, you know, a hundred different opinions on where these lines get drawn and it's going to be pretty substantial chaos for quite a long time. Um, and I think the other, uh, the other revolutionary effect of it, or one other, is to the extent, and I don't think it's clear from the set of opinions, but to the extent that this mosaic or pervasiveness theory clearly becomes adopted by the courts, and again, I don't, it's not clear to me whether it will be or not, that has just profound implications because it's not just going to, generally, Fourth Amendment surveillance law has been principally about collection of information somewhat about use of information, almost nothing about analysis of information. And now you're going to have a situation where, you know, privacy by obscurity I think has been dead for quite some time, but, but if you have courts start looking at, well, if the government collects these 20 pieces of information in isolation, that is constitutional, but if they have analytical tools that let them put that information together, it's not, that's just a whole other new world that's just opened up. I think the, the combination of those two answers kind of nails it, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe put a gloss on it. Um, the court's very lack of direction here, I think, um, is a strong signal um, to um, the department and to law enforcement to come forward, and in that sense, I'm, I'm reinscribing this uh, gentleman's question a little bit, and what it did come forward with the potential five votes for a mosaic theory, um, the potential lack of deference in the future for the complicated nature of uh, all the technology, um, seems to me the court's at least, you know, suggestion uh, that it is time to find a legislative solution for this and for the parties to meet on the right turf. Um, no fewer than, you know, I, I, there must have been a half a dozen times uh, <coughs> people referred to uh, metaphors of 1984 and um, of, I remember Scalia's quote in oral argument, wasn't it something like, you know, aren't there any legislatures around here? Um, <laughs> um, uh, the direction is strong for your side and for this side to come forward. I agree with Stephanie's evaluation that um, a threat to change Title 18 from the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, and um, for Jason Chaffetz to be the horse in the House is not a strong threat to you guys. But those suggestions from the court are strong direction that all the stakeholders need to come forward and do something serious on ECPA, on location technology, on these issues, and update the law, or the courts will be forced to at least five of them blow up like the characters in Judge Smith's video. Um, <laughs> well, you know, maybe I could just say, I'm sorry, right, but no, uh, I, I honestly don't think that it's as dire as possibly, uh, you know, we've been, in the tone that we've been discussing it. This was a, a very, uh, well, it was common situation to have uh, GPS trackers on cars. It, it has a unique uh, aspect to it in which you are having the uh, uh, real world colliding with uh, the, the digital world here. And most times when we're collecting evidence, what we do is we're collecting evidence, purely digital evidence from a company. We're going and we're doing a search warrant. We're, we're searching their computers for whatever. And the way we justify it is we look back to an analog in a real world of file cabinets or something like that. Here, you have both of them at the same time. It's not very common because you have the real world placement of the item, the real world collection of the data, and then the, the cyber world collection of the data and the cyber world collection uh, analysis of the data. So it's, it's not, uh, to me, all that surprising that the uh, decision is going to be uh, somewhat confusing. 
yeah. clearly true. And on, on the holding itself, I agree with you. I, I find it, you know, rather undramatic and inconsequential. But I'm talking about the signals the court's giving by the open-endedness and, and not foreclosing things as it normally does, as, as Mr. Weissman's pointed out, and by seriously engaging that, you know, technological pace of change is no longer going to be an excuse. And there is this mosaic theory that, you know, even Jim Dempsey says is a little weird, and I bet, you know, given the bottle of wine in a couple of hours, I could get Kevin Banston to say so. But, but uh, you know, that is the upheld knife, and, and my question is, does that not signal a time for genuine attempt at a legislative solution? Uh, the holding's nothing, it's the signal of the, the opinion. I just say two quick things about that. One is I'm going to start participating in the CDT Digital Due Process Coalition phone calls again. And the second one is I'm going to uh, work hard on buying stock in the company that's inventing the nano constable right now. All right, I think we're, we're, we're about there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, the panelists, uh, for their. <coughs>